Hi, this is Bobby, and today we're going to continue talking about our identity in Christ. And an important aspect of our identity in Christ is that our Father wants us to have prosperity in life. And the Bible says that my God will supply all of your needs through his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Amen? So that is the will of God, and that's what we're going to look at over the next two sessions. Okay, so the topics we're going to cover. So first of all, we're going to take a really good look at the prosperity will of God for us. Okay, and there's five key aspects here. So first of all, we'll see that prosperity is part of our salvation. Okay, that means that Jesus paid for something. Jesus became poor for us to become rich. Okay, so our salvation includes prosperity. And then we'll also see that God's will is that he wants to supply all of our needs through Jesus. God's will is that he wants us to have work. We'll see that Prosperity also comes through sowing and reaping. So as we are generous givers, it will be poured back upon us. Whatever you sow, you will reap the same back in greater proportion. Okay, then also we'll see that walking in love results in automatic blessings and prosperity. So the more we walk in love, the more blessed life we'll have in general, which includes prosperity. Okay, then lastly, we'll look at how to pray for needs, finances, and employment. All right. Let's start off by looking at salvation, and on this page we'll see that prosperity is included in salvation. Okay, number one, prosperity is included in the full salvation that Jesus has provided to us. Everything that Jesus did, he did for all people. Every aspect of salvation comes about in the same way. First, we must know what Jesus has provided to us and believe it in our hearts. Secondly, we must confess it with our mouths, which will bring it to pass. Okay, and so something that we need to do for homework every day if possible is we need to be taking key scriptures that talk about our identity, about health, about provision, about protection, about authority, about helping others, about healing the sick. You know, so we need to be taking a diverse, a, a, a diverse group of scriptures and we need to be believing them in our heart and we need to continuously be confessing them so that they'll come true in our lives. And I'll exemplify that in a minute. Okay, Romans 10, 9 to 10 tells us the mechanism by which salvation works. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Okay, now he's talking about forgiveness of sins and eternal life in this passage. That's what he's referring to. However, this is the law of faith right here. This is the law of faith. This is how any and every aspect of salvation works. We need to believe something in our heart. We need to believe something that Jesus has done for us in our heart. And then we need to proclaim it. We need to confess it with our mouth. We need to claim it as ours. And when we do that, that aspect of salvation will come true. And it's not limited to salvation, but just in general, this is the law of faith. Whatever you believe in your heart, and speak out of your mouth without doubting, it will come true. Amen. Okay, we can see this also in passages like Mark eleven twenty two to 24, where Jesus describes this uh, prayer of faith. Okay, number three, every aspect of salvation is the same. Jesus paid for something to give us a corresponding benefit. He died for the sins of all people so that anyone who believes and confesses him will be forgiven of their sins and receive eternal life. Jesus, he also bore our sicknesses and he took stripes on his back, which paid for our healing, which provided for us to abide in health and provided for us to be healed to anyone who believes. Jesus also became poor for all people so that anyone who believes and confesses him shall be made rich. Okay, now Bible rich, let me just define that. Bible rich is not greedy American rich. Bible rich means that all of your needs are always met with an abundance left over for every good work. Okay? You can find that definition in 2 Corinthians. Okay, So, Jesus became poor for us to be made rich. So, if we will believe in what he has done here and then confess that, then we can manifest that in our lives, which is his will, which is what Jesus paid for. The key thing I want to bring out here is that Jesus suffered many different things to give us benefits. And everything he suffered gives us a corresponding benefit. And so we named a few of them here, 
but let us not waste anything that Jesus has done. Jesus literally suffered in his body. He suffered in his soul. He suffered in his life. And he did that for the purpose of giving us a benefit. And we want to make sure that we learn all the things that he suffered for us and that we get all the benefit that he paid for. And when we do that, first of all, we're going to be blessed because we're going to have the the good things that he paid for. Secondly, Jesus will be honored because he paid a price for us to have these things. And it honors him when we can believe in what he did and when we can receive that thing. Amen. Okay, so let us set our heart to believe in all the good things that he has done for us by suffering for us so that we get the benefits. Okay, so 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Okay, so here it is right here. Jesus suffered poverty on our behalf so that through his poverty we are made rich. It's the same thing as Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that we will not be put to death for our sins. Jesus suffered separation from Father for us so that we will never be separated from Father. Jesus suffered the darkness of Hades for us so that we will never set foot into Hades. Jesus you know, suffered the stripes on his back to give us healing. Jesus was punished so that through his punishment we have peace. You know, so you can go on down the list of all the things Jesus did. So every aspect of salvation, or you can call it redemption, it's all the same. Jesus paid a price, and then we get a benefit. But we have to believe what he has done, and then we have to proclaim it. Okay? All right, now I want to show you through the salvation words that um, we have another proof point that that prosperity and provision is part of our salvation. So when we, when we read Psalm 91, 16, it says, With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. This word salvation is the word Yeshua. And this is a variation of the same word, which is also Jesus' name in Hebrew. Okay, so this word Yeshua, it means something saved, deliverance, aid, victory, prosperity, health, help, salvation, save, saving health, which we call healing, and welfare. Okay, so you'll notice if you read the entire Psalm 91, Psalm 91 is all about salvation. And it exemplifies all the different aspects of salvation, which we have more from a protection aspect in this physical life on earth. When you read Psalm 91, it doesn't say anything about eternal life. It's entirely about salvation in this present life, and it exemplifies many of these different aspects right here. Okay? So it's very important for us to realize that, that the salvation that Jesus brings us is so much more than I get to go to heaven when I die. It is so much more than that. It is for every single day of your life. It is salvation for every day of your life to bring protection, to bring deliverance, to bring the aid, the help of God, to keep you safe, to, to keep you in health, to bring you healing, to give you good welfare in life. All of this is included in your salvation. Okay, now we're talking about prosperity. So from a prosperity perspective, it says right here that um, Yeshua, it includes prosperity. Yeshua, salvation, includes welfare. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him prosperity. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him good welfare in life. Amen? Okay, so this is part of your salvation. Now, let's just look at these words and get a better understanding of what they really mean. Okay, so prosperity. Prosperity means a successful, flourishing, or thriving condition, especially in financial respects. It also includes good fortune. Okay, so when he says, with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation, this includes um, successful financial life, flourishing financial life, thriving financial life, as well as other aspects. Okay, so our father, he is a father. Father God is a father. Fathers love their children. Fathers want their children to prosper in life. Fathers don't want their children to be poor. Fathers don't want their children to struggle and worry about, can I pay my bills? Can I eat? You know, what am I going to do? Fathers don't want their children to worry. Fathers always want their children to prosper. It's the same thing with our Heavenly Father, but He has more perfect love for us, and He has the ability to make this come forth. 
Amen? So our Father's will is to prosper us, and Jesus paid for it, that through his poverty we are made rich. So that's good news. Okay, now let's look at this word welfare. Welfare means exemption from misfortune, sickness, calamity, or evil. Welfare means the enjoyment of health and the common blessings of life. Welfare means prosperity and also happiness. Okay, so when you have good welfare in life, that is an amazing life. I mean, can you imagine this? Exemption from misfortune. Okay, that means you're walking in blessing instead of curse. Exemption from sickness. That means that by the stripes of Jesus, you are walking in health and you are not getting sick. Exemption from calamity. That means you are experiencing salvation daily. You are experiencing deliverance. You are having victory in life. Amen? That means that you are being preserved from harm. That means you have the help of God in your life. Okay, exemption from evil. No evil shall befall you. Remember it says that earlier in Psalm 91, no evil shall befall you, which literally means no evil shall come upon you. No evil shall encounter you. No evil shall be allowed to meet up with you. What did Jesus say? Nothing shall by any means harm you. Okay, so this preservation, protection of God, preservation from misfortune, preservation from sickness, preservation from calamity, preservation from evil, all of that is included in this word welfare, which is part of your salvation. So that's just amazing. Okay, now from a prosperity perspective, um, this word welfare means the enjoyment of health and the common blessings of life. Prosperity. So it specifically calls out prosperity, and that includes financial prosperity. Okay, so our Father wants us to have a blessed life. He wants us to have a prosperous life. He wants us to have all the financial needs that we have in life fulfilled with an abundance left over for every good work. Okay, and we'll see that later on in another scripture from 2 Corinthians. All right? Okay, so this is good news. So with long life, I will satisfy him and show him prosperity and show him welfare and show him to be flourishing and thriving, especially in financial respects. With long life, I will satisfy him and give him common blessings of life and prosperity and happiness and exemption from misfortune. Amen? So this is extremely good news. So what we can see so far is that most definitely Jesus paid for us to be made rich. We can see that it's included in the salvation words that we see in the Old Testament in the word Yeshua. And then now let's look at John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Okay, now this word saved, this is a Greek word sozo. And sozo means to save, to deliver, to protect, to heal, to preserve, to do well, which means to prosper, and to be made whole. Okay? So this is very similar to the word Yeshua. It's just a Greek New, New Testament word. Okay, so Jesus came into this world to save the world. Jesus came into this world to deliver the world. Jesus came into this world to protect the world, to heal the people, to preserve the people, preserve them from harm, preserve them from evil, preserve them from sickness, preserve them from ruin, destruction, and curse. So he came to give us preservation salvation. Jesus came in this world to, to prosper us so that we do well in life. Jesus came in this world to make us whole. Okay, so again, you can see that the salvation words that we see in the Bible, they mean a lot more than just, I get to go to heaven when I die. They include things that you need in everyday life. Amen? Okay, so when we read this scripture, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be prospered, that the world through him will do well in life, that the world through him will have all of their needs met at all times with extra left over to help other people. Okay, that is really the salvation that Jesus brings us. Okay, so prosperity is included in salvation. He paid for it. We see it in the salvation words in the Old Testament. We see it in the salvation words in the New Testament. And you can find many scriptures where that's coming to pass, where Jesus is bringing forth um, prosperity. So for example, the people had need of food. And what did he do? He multiplied the food on multiple occasions. People had, um, they had need of tax money. What did he do? He sent Peter to go fishing, and the first fish he caught had a coin in his mouth with which they could pay taxes. And so you can find other examples as well. But what you see is that God's will is to provide all of our needs at all times 
and Jesus paid for this. He became poor so that we are made rich, so that all of our needs are always met with an abundance left over for every good work. Okay, now let me just show you what I do in terms of confession. So we should do confession of scripture every day. So I'll take a passage like Psalm 9116, and I will confess and include all these different aspects that are part of salvation. And what you want to do is, you know, first of all, you want to be believing in your heart this full salvation that Jesus gives us. Psalm 91 uh, is a prophecy of the salvation that believers will receive. Okay, now we need to read something like Psalm 91. We need to believe it and we need to be proclaiming it. And what's going to help your believing is if you'll read testimony books, which will help you to come to believe. Or if you'll find videos online of testimonies, that's going to help you to believe the scriptures. Okay, so I'm constantly, every day, I'm reading books like little testimony books like Chicken Soup for the Soul has books about miracles, about angels, about answered prayers. You have authors like Karen Kingsbury who has some miracle books. And, and these are just good little short stories. And some are more miraculous than others. But nonetheless, when you're reading these little short stories every day, you just constantly have on your mind that God is going to do good things for you. You can see him working in other people's lives in a variety of different ways through these stories. And that's going to strengthen you in believing that, he's, that he will do good things for you as well. Okay, so I encourage you to do that. Okay, so with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. I declare in the name of Jesus, I will live a long life. I will live a satisfying life. And every day of my life, I shall experience the, f the full salvation of Jesus Christ. I will live a long life and I will have the deliverance of God in my daily life such that no evil will come upon me. I am delivered from all evil. Before evil can even draw near to me, I am delivered from evil. With long life, I will be satisfied, and every day of my life, I will have the aid and the help and the assistance of God in my life so that I abide in constant victory. With long life, I will be satisfied, and every day of my life, I will have victory in life. I shall have prosperity in life, and I declare in the name of Jesus that I prosper in every facet of life. In the name of Jesus, I declare that I prosper in finances. In the name of Jesus, I declare that I prosper in my job. In the name of Jesus, I declare that I prosper in doing good works. I prosper in ministry work. I prosper in doing the will of God. I prosper in every facet of life. I am successful in every facet of life. I flourish. I thrive. I declare in the name of Jesus that I flourish in financial respects. I declare in Jesus' name that with long life I will be satisfied and every day of my life I will experience good welfare and life. I declare that I am exempted from misfortune. I shall not experience misfortune. I am exempt from sickness. I am exempt from calamity. No evil can come upon me. I declare in the name of Jesus that with long life I will be satisfied and I will experience the good welfare of God which is part of my salvation every day of my life. Therefore, Every day is a blessed day. Every day I will be blessed and I shall not be cursed. Every day I abide in constant prosperity and I have happiness in my soul and so be it in Jesus name. Okay, so now what I've just done is I've taken this little, this one little verse here and I've expanded upon it, including in it all these different aspects of the definition of the word. And you could even go further. I don't think I talked about health in there. But you can go through this and plug in all these different definitions of the word into the scripture and confess it over yourself. And it will come true. I do walk in full salvation. I do have a flourishing life. I do walk in victory. I am constantly kept safe from evil. I abide in victory. Bad things might try to come, but I always get the victory because I always have the aid of God. I always have the help of God. Therefore, I always get victory through Jesus Christ. Okay, so this the same is true for anyone who will believe in this. Okay, so be believing in this and be proclaiming it and include in your proclamation things around prosperity and good welfare. Amen. You can do the same thing with John 3.17 or any other scripture that you wish. Okay, God's will is to supply all of your needs through Jesus. Our Father's good will is that we be blessed and prosperous in life. We know that if we ask for anything according to his will, the answer is yes. We also know that every promise of God, the answer is yes. 
Like for example, in 1 John 5, 14 to 15. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. All right, so he's telling us right here, if we will learn his good will, and if we will believe it, and if we will pray accordingly, it will be done. Okay, so he says that we should be confident in him. We should be confident when we pray according to his will. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, our Father, that if we ask anything according to our Father's will, he will hear us. Okay, let me just use a different word besides will. According to his desires. That word will means what are the heart desires of God? Okay, first of all, Jesus said we would know the love of God by his name. His name is Father. Okay, so we know the love of God by his name. The name of God is Father. Okay, and a father has desires for us. He has a good will for us. He has certain heart desires for us. And so when you, when you ask somebody to do something that they desire to do already, you don't have to convince them. We don't have to convince God to do the good things that he already desires to do for us. That is his good will. Our father's heart is filled with good desires, good wishes, a good will for us. His heart desires to prosper us in all things. His heart desires to prosper us in health. His heart desires for us to be prosperous in our soul. His heart desire is for all of our needs to be met. His heart desires that we never lack any good thing. Okay, so that is what his heart's desire is. And so when we pray for our Father's own desires to be done, they will be done. Amen? So the same thing would be true of, of, of any of us, right? So the other day, I like to I like to cook meat and I like to make desserts. I mean, forget the vegetables. Okay, so I like meat and desserts. And and some coworkers, they were like, Bobby, I'd really like for you to make one of those tres leches cakes. Well, they didn't have to convince me to make a tres leches cake. I I love to make desserts. I love to cook for people. I like to eat good food. I like to give good food. You know, that's fun for me. That's my heart desire. Okay, so they didn't have to convince me. They didn't have to beg me. They didn't have to twist my arm. You know, they said, hey, we really want one of those Tress Lutch's cakes. So I made one and brought it to work yesterday. And they were happy and I was happy. Okay, well, that's a, a minor example, but it's exactly the same thing with our Father. When we're praying for prosperity, when we're praying for someone's needs to be met, when we're praying for someone to get a job, when we're praying for someone to be healed, when we're praying for anything that is his desire, he will gladly do it. And in fact, Jesus already suffered something to give us those benefits. Amen? So be confident when you pray for God's will. Be knowing his will. Be knowing his heart's desire. And then when you pray according to his heart's desires, it will be done. Okay? And his heart's desires are revealed through the things that Jesus suffered and the benefits they bring. His heart's desires are revealed, especially in the New Testament and in the works that we saw Jesus doing. Okay, so his will is evident. Uh, it's evident in the Bible, and we need to see it and believe it and pray accordingly, and we will be amazed. Amen? Okay, so let's finish reading these points here. So number two, what we see in the Bible is that prosperity is part of our salvation, and in fact, Jesus paid for it by suffering poverty on our behalf. Our Father even desires that evil people have their basic needs met, and His perfection is that He blesses even His enemies. If Father blesses His enemies, how much more will He bless His own children? Okay, so we can look in Matthew chapter 5, for example, and we'll see where Jesus was describing the perfection of our Father, and He said that He sends sun and rain on the good and on the evil. Okay, so He's providing even for the basic needs of all people. He wants people's needs to be met. Obviously, he wants us to turn to Jesus and experience full salvation. But even evil people who reject him, he still wants their needs to be met. He is a good father even to evil people. He loves all people. And he loves us all. That's why he's provided a mechanism for salvation through Jesus. Amen? Okay, we can also look at the life of Jesus and see how he loved his enemies. Remember that they came to arrest him. And there was a mob of people that came to arrest him. And one of the people was a Malchus. And Malchus got his ear cut off. Peter swung his sword and cut off Malchus's ear. 
And keep in mind, Malchus was one of the people who was coming to arrest Jesus, to lead Jesus away, to be tortured and killed, and to be humiliated. And what did Jesus do? You know, it would probably, probably one of us might have been happy to see his ear cut off. And, you know, you, you deserve that. You know, you're leading me to, be, you're leading me away to be tortured. You deserve to have both ears cut off. You know, we, we may be inclined to think that way because that's worldly thinking, right? We need to fight against that kind of thinking. And we need to think like our big brother, Jesus, big brother, Jesus. What did he do? He knew he was going to be tortured, killed and humiliated. He knew that this guy was coming to lead him away to experience all that evil However, Jesus picked up his ear and he healed him. Jesus healed someone who was taking him away to be tortured, killed, and humiliated. He healed him. Amen? Okay, so that just shows the heart of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The heart of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is that they are good to all people, okay? Especially to his own children. But you see that he's healing even people that are obvious enemies. Okay, we also saw Jesus... When after they, after they um, whipped him, after they scourged him, after they crucified him, beat him, spit on him, stripped him naked, did all those things, and and they freshly nailed him to the cross. As he's freshly nailed to the cross, what does he do? He prays for those people that tortured him and are murdering him. He prayed for them, for them to be forgiven. Okay, so just always keep in mind the the goodwill of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Their, their love for all people, and their blessing of even evil people. Amen? Keep that in mind. So if you can see God blessing the evil people, if you can see Jesus healing somebody that was leading him away to be tortured and killed, if you can see Jesus praying for people that tortured and murdered him, then if you can see that, then it should be easy to believe in these other good things towards his children, like prosperity being part of salvation. Amen? Okay, now 3 John 1, 2, this is a nice summary of the good will of God for you. Beloved, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Okay, now depending on what Bible version you read, you'll see different definitions for this word pray, or you'll see a different English word rather. Okay, this is the Greek word euchamai, which means to wish, to pray, to will or to desire. Okay, so the reason I put this definition here is I want you to, to notice that really he's expressing his will here. Okay, God is expressing his good will. He's expressing his wishes and desires towards you. Beloved, I wish, I pray, I will, I desire that you prosper in all things. Okay, now when we encounter words like this in the Bible, like all or nothing, a lot of times, these little phrases, they don't, they don't have any meaning to us because we can't picture it. So what you need to do is you need to take this, this scripture and start, start putting some things in there and start confessing it. Okay, so this is a great confession scripture. I am a beloved son of God. I am a beloved son of God. I am a beloved brother of Jesus and I prosper in all things. I am a son of God, and I prosper abundantly in my finances. I am a son of God, and I prosper abundantly with generosity. I am a son of God, and I prosper in doing the will of God. I prosper in healing the sick and healing them all. I prosper in casting out unclean spirits. I prosper in raising the dead and raising them all. I am a beloved son of God, and I prosper in all ministry work. I prosper in making disciples, in preaching and teaching. Okay, so you get the idea. So you want to take this and just plug in a million different things in there and confess it. You know, I prosper in my job. I prosper in school. I prosper in relationships. I prosper in loving people with action. I prosper in helping people with needs. You know, just go on and on and on. Just be confessing. I am a beloved son of God in whom my father is well pleased. And I prosper in this and that and that and the other. Okay. And do this every day. And these things, they come true. Amen. First of all, it's going to expand your understanding of what, what all things means. All things means all things. Just like you want your own children to succeed in everything. You want your own children to prosper in everything. 
You know, assuming they're not doing evil things, you want them to prosper in all good things that they're doing. So think of every good thing that you can plug into the scripture and confess it. Then this scripture will come alive. Then you will truly see the will of God. Amen. And again, the easiest way to really lay hold of the will of God is to recognize him as a father, a loving father who loves you. Okay. And then you'll get a better idea of what this means. Okay. So take this passage, be confessing this prosperity in all things, including financial, including work, including investments, you know, just speak it over all these things. Okay. Don't limit it to financial things, you know, put in their ministry things, put in their godly things, put in their will of God things, put in their works of Jesus things, right? Okay. So be confessing that over yourself and be confessing it over others. Okay. Also, you know, we're focused on prosperity today, but you know, be confessing the health and healing aspects. Be confessing that you have a prosperous soul filled with love, filled with joy, filled with peace, full of faith, full of hope, you know, and so forth. Amen? Okay, and again, the mechanism of faith is this. You believe something in your heart, you speak it out of your mouth without doubting, and it will come true. And so the more you're confessing Bible passages, believing them, the more goodness and fullness of blessing you're going to experience in your life. Amen. All right. Number five, Philippians 419. And my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Okay. So our father's goodwill is to supply all your need. That means anything you could need. And he's going to do it through Jesus. So again, we have one of these all words, all your need. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means whatever needs you have. If you have needs for finances, that's included. If you need your car repaired, that's included. If you need your air conditioner fixed, that's included. If you need rent money, that's included. You know, whatever your need is, okay? And so again, take a verse like this and be confessing it over your life, be speaking it over other people's lives and put in specific things so that you can get a fuller understanding of what your father's heart intention is. And then as you're speaking and believing, it's going to come true for you. Amen. And let me just read the next verse and then I'll give some examples on, on Philippians 4.19. Okay, so in Psalm 34, 8 to 10, it says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Okay, so this is an Old Testament example, and this word fear truly means reverence. So those who reverence God, they will have no lack. Okay, now again, this ties back to the Bible definition of rich. You are rich if you never lack anything. That is a true definition of rich. You are needy if you have unfulfilled needs. You are rich if all of your needs are always met. Okay, well, the will of God is all of your needs to be always met with an abundance left over for every good work. And again, he says, those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Okay, so our Father's will is clear. He wants all of your needs to always be met. He doesn't want you to ever have lack of any good thing. He wants to supply all of your needs through Jesus. He wants you to prosper in all things and in health and in your soul. Okay, so this is the good will of God. Okay, now let me just talk about an example related to Philippians 4.19. So I had a, a friend um, named Robert, and Robert was a veteran, and he was severely injured in combat. And... And so anyway, he was having a complication and went to the hospital and he went in for surgery. And right before he had gone in for the surgery, he had just rented this little garage apartment and the garage apartment was in bad condition. And, you know, whenever it would rain, water would come in this um, apartment. It had, it had roaches. It had, it just had a lot of problems. Okay. So anyway, he was in the hospital for some time. And when he got released, he came home and then he called me up and he was, he was almost crying because just things were just so miserable at his apartment. He said, first of all, there, there's no closets. Um, there, there's no closet space. It's just like, it's you know, it was a garage. And so it's just a square room. There's no closet. There's no place to hang the clothes. So all of his belongings uh, were in suitcases on the floor. And when it rained, all that water came in and it, it, it ruined his clothes. Everything was dirty and moldy and whatever. And so he was upset about the clothes. Then he said that... Um, 
You know, he was upset because he had no bed. He didn't have a table. He didn't have any chairs. There were roaches everywhere. And you know, he named like five or six different things that were, that were needs. And so he was just, he was sad. He was depressed because he came home from having this surgery and this medical complication only to come home to this miserable environment. And all we did was we read this verse. I'm like, Robert, let me just read this verse. And, and then I read it. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I said, okay, we're going to pray for this. And then we just prayed short and sweet, just like this. Daddy and Jesus and Holy Spirit, we love you. And Daddy, we thank you that you are Robert's father and you love him. And you have promised that you would supply all of his needs through Jesus. So right now, in the name of Jesus, every single need of Robert be fulfilled now in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Daddy, and we thank you, Jesus, and amen. Okay, literally, it was a tiny little prayer just like that. We did not say any specific thing. We didn't ask for anything specific. Okay, so Robert had just finished telling me what his needs were. So then, a couple of hours later, I start getting text messages. And so I get a text message, and he's like, Bobby, you're not going to believe it. It's like the lady that I rent the apartment from, she came and knocked on the door to check on me. And then she saw that, you know, everything was a mess. And so she, um, she took all my clothes and she did my laundry for me, you know, cause remember his clothes were on the floor and they got messed up when the rain came in. And then there was a knock on the door a little bit later and somebody came and delivered a bed to him. And then a little while later, Another knock, another knock on the door, and somebody came and delivered a table and chairs to him. And then later on, another knock on the door, and somebody came to do repairs, you know, so that the, the rainwater wouldn't come in. And then again, you know, another knock on the door, and an exterminator came to deal with the roach problem. You know, so every single thing that he mentioned to me as a need and a problem that he was experiencing, all of them were fulfilled from that tiny little prayer that we prayed that God would supply all of his needs. Isn't that amazing? Like I have to fight back tears every time I tell that story because it just touches my heart. So our father loves you just the same as he loves Robert, just the same as he loves me. He loves us all and he wants to supply your needs, whatever your need is, whether it's money, whether it's exterminator, whether it's a repair, no matter what it is, he wants to supply your need and he will do it through Jesus if you will believe in this. And then, you know, he said, be confident when you pray for his heart desire. His heart desire is all your need be met. Amen. So believe that and pray in agreement with that and it will be done. Okay. On this page, God's will is for us to have work. Okay, so this is important because this means we can have confidence when we pray for people to get a job because it is our Father's heart desire that we have work. Number one, God's will is that he wants us to have work. He gives us the power to get wealth. He gives every person various talents and ideas with which they have the responsibility to utilize. God said that he would bless all the work of our hands. We need to put our hands to something in order for him to bless us. If we own a business, he will bless it. If we are a farmer, he will bless our crops. If we are a salesman, he will bless our sales. We must put our hand to something to receive this blessing. And now if we go back to the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 28, 12, it says, The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Okay, now if you just take a minute and just think about this. Our Father wants to just open his treasure upon you. He wants to prosper you in life. He wants to bless you. He wants to bring rain to your land, okay, to bless all the work of your hand. So this is a farming example that's listed here, but he's not limited to helping farmers. This is showing you his heart intention. His heart intention is to water, to fertilize, to flourish whatever you do in life. He says he will bless all the work of your hand. Okay, so this means we need to change. We need to change what we believe in our heart. Most people, or not most, but many people have a negative perspective on life. Many people are expecting work to, to go 
badly. Many people are expecting financial difficulty. Many people are expecting to experience curse in life instead of blessing in life. Okay, and as long as somebody has that kind of meditation and belief in their heart, they're going to experience that. So we need to transform our believing and our speaking to be aligned to his goodwill. And it takes work to do this. Okay, but I confess scripture several times a week and I'm confessing blessings. I'm confessing health. I'm confessing prosperity. I'm confessing that I have authority. I'm confessing that I heal the sick. So I have a, a list of 90 something scriptures that I go through on a regular basis and I and I want to be believing and speaking these things, and I transform the meditation of my heart. I transform my expectation from failure to victory in life. I transform my expectation from curse or failure or evil. I transform from that to expecting good things, expecting blessing, expecting victory, expecting prosperity. So we have to work at this because a lot of us are programmed towards negativity. You know, if you watch the news, you're programmed towards negativity. If you listen to negative people around you in life, maybe in your home or at work, there's a lot of negativity. And so we have to fight against that. Okay. Now, the will of God is clear. He wants to bless all the work of your hand. So we need to put our hand to something. You know, if we have a job, expect to be blessed. You know, if a problem comes up at work, expect to get the victory. If a new project comes, expect to get victory. Expect to have the resources. Expect to have the time. Expect to have whatever you need to, to succeed in the project or succeed in your job or succeed in school or, or whatever you're doing in life. His will is he will bless everything that you put your hand to. Amen? Okay, so that's good news. So expect to be blessed. Be confessing blessing over yourself. And if he's blessing the work of your hands, then that means your job is going to be blessed. Your business is going to be blessed. Your crops are going to be blessed. Whatever you're doing will be blessed. That means you will prosper. That means you will have included in that would be financial prosperity. Okay, and if the financial prosperity wasn't clear enough, then you can see it here. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And this is profound. The will of God is that we are so prosperous that we should be lenders and givers and we should have no need to ever borrow. That is the will of God. And keep in mind that many people are borrowing every day without even realizing it. Every time you use a credit card and you're not paying that balance in full at the end of the month, what are you doing? You're borrowing. Okay, you shouldn't have to do that. You should not have to do that because your father wants to fulfill all of your needs. And he says, you shall lend, but you shall not borrow. So we need to be believing scriptures like this, be confessing it, be expecting blessing in all the work of our hands, be expecting financial blessing, be expecting blessing in the job, be expecting blessing in every facet of life. Transform from a negative mindset and a failure mindset and a poverty mindset, transform from that to a blessed mindset. You need to expect that the grace of God is upon me. The blessing of God rests upon me. The favor of God rests upon me. The victory of God rests upon me. I have the aid and the help of God in everything that I do in life. I am blessed in my finances. I am blessed in my job. I am blessed in my farming. I am blessed in everything that I do in life. It is blessed. Everything that I do in life prospers. Everything that I do in life, it shall succeed. And I am so blessed that I am a lender and I am a giver, but I have no need to borrow. Not today or now never in the future. And so be it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. Now Deuteronomy 8.18 says, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Okay. He gives you power to get wealth. Okay. So God has given all of us special talents, abilities, intellects, um, we all have different, you know, different aspects, different features, right? And we need to do things in life. We, he has given us the power to get wealth and we need to do something with them. Okay. We need to get a job. We need to do work of some kind. We need to, we need to be active doing something. And he gives us the power to get wealth. So his will is not that we sit idle and just you know, consume from other people and that other people constantly have to give to us to fulfill our needs. That is not his will. 
Now, his will is that if you do have a need that somebody could give to you and, and take care of that, that need, but his will is not for you to sit inactive, not doing anything because he has given every single person power to get wealth. That means every person has a responsibility to do something to generate wealth. Amen. So it is not his intention that we sit idle doing nothing. Number five, God's will is that we should help people with true needs. Some people desire work and seek it, yet they are temporarily unemployed and have financial needs. We should help such people. However, he stated through Paul that people who refuse to work don't deserve to eat. God also said that we should provide for our own household. His will is not that we be idle without work, but that we contribute. Okay, so these next couple of passages are written in a negative sense because Paul was dealing with um, a problem that that he was experiencing among some people he was ministering to. Okay, so let's not look at it from a negative perspective, but we can identify the will of God in these passages, even though these are in a negative context. So in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Okay, so this is in a negative sense, but what's the positive of it? What we see in here is that the will of God is that we have work. The will of God is that we have work so that we can eat. Okay? He has given us the power to get wealth. He will bless all the work of our hands. So if he's going to bless the work of our hands and our hands aren't doing anything, there's nothing to bless. If he gives us the power to get wealth and we don't do, do something to generate wealth, there's nothing to bless. Okay? And, and, and there's some people that they just want to do nothing and they want all of their needs to be taken care of. Okay, that is not aligned to the will of God. Okay, so we need to recognize we need to be doing something in life. God will bless it. He gives us the power to get wealth. He wants all of our needs to be fulfilled. And he wants us to have work. And therefore, we shall eat. Okay, so the will of God is he wants us to have work. And that means that we can have confidence when we're praying for somebody to get a job, that a job will come forth. In 1 Timothy 5 eight, it says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Okay, so again, this is a negative context, but you can see the will of God. The will of God is that we be doing something to generate income or wealth or grow, grow crops or, or animals to provide for our family. So God's will is that we put our hand to something to provide for our family. God's will is that we should work so that we can eat. God's will is for us to do something so he can bless what we are doing. God's will is that we are so blessed that we lend and we give and we do not need to borrow. Okay. So what we're seeing on this page is that God's will is that he wants us to do work of some kind and he will bless it. Now, this doesn't have to be working at a job. It could be farming. It could be raising animals. It could be growing crops. It could be, um, you know, it could be teaching. It could be it could be any number of things, okay? So he wants us to do something. He wants us to contribute to life. He wants every person to contribute. All right? And so we saw specifically that he wants us to be active doing things, and that we know that we can pray for anything according to his will, and he will do it. Therefore, we can be confident praying for someone to get a job because his will is for us to have work and contribute to our families and to the lives of others. Okay, so on this page, the major thing I wanted to prove is that God's will is for us to have work, and that will fulfill the requirement for us to have confidence and pray for his heart desire. So we can pray for someone to get a job, and it shall be done. Okay, so that's going to be it for today. So in the next session, we'll continue and we'll talk about the law of sowing and reaping. We'll talk about walking in love for God and love for man results in, in receiving the Old Testament blessings that we see in Deuteronomy 28. We'll talk about what the true fast is, and then next time we'll also talk about how to pray effectively for people's needs, work, and finances. So God bless you, and we'll talk soon.